Yes, a slightly ah, different goal music. play this week. Throughout the summer, we have been uh, bringing you some of the bits we used to do over the years uh, mm. on the show in the dim distant past, like the birthday spread and sport on Norton Escalado. We'll do something slightly different today. Just before the end of the show, we used to play a, a little bit of uh, a tape we happened upon. Actually, a listener sent us this well, tape. We had, we had a whole series of them. We oh, had we did. Lots we of did. different sports. Uh, better really. Tennis with John Newcomb. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Keep Fit with Graham Williams. John former, Arlott, of course. John Arlott, yeah. The Yetis. Uh, that's right. So we used to play these, uh, these uh, audio tapes. And, and this was a, a, a book that Fred wrote, his first uh, autobiography, the great F.S. Truman, the uh, England and Yorkshire fast bowler, one of the greats of, uh, of English cricket. A truly wonderful. Wonderful bowler with yeah. a, a tremendous action, pure action, and uh, first to 300 wickets, just a tremendous, and became a celebrity. Yeah, there, an amazing character, presented a TV yeah. show called Indoor League, mm. cult viewing uh, for many of a certain age, after the Sullivans at uh, 1.30 <laughs> during the week when you're on your school holidays. So uh, Fred became a, a bit of a, something of a personality after his uh, cricket career, and during his cricket career, and of course uh, brilliant on the commentary teams as well. But this tape was the first of the, when he had brought out his second autobiography came and saw us and we, we got to mm. meet him didn't we but the first autobiography um was an interesting one and he he, he, he talked cricket and he talked about his life as well uh, and said he had a life beyond cricket so we're going to kick off with one section of the tape uh, telling a story of how he uh, basically got involved in a very yeah. different world. Of course, it starts with Fred's mantra. Oh, it does. I, I mustn't forget that. This is yeah. why we always kicked it off. So this will be a bit of a nostalgia for long-term listeners. This is the way Fred would kick off his tape. I'm always ready to coach anybody from international to schoolboy cricketers because I feel an obligation to do so. In spite of all my troubles, I know I owe the game of cricket a great deal and I'm willing to put something back. Nice. Every time we watched in AC Milan after that, we kept saying, I've got an obligation to go to so. We did. We couldn't get out of the habit of it. <laughs> you know. So, um, this is Fred, yeah, talking about his move into a, a different area beyond cricket. At the beginning, I was game for anything. And I found my name leaping out of the headlines again in 1969, when I went on the board as a nightclub comedian. I had no ambition in that direction, really. I did it because I accepted a silly bet made when I was in a club in the northeast listening to a pretty poor comedian. I asked the owner what he was paying the man and was amazed when he said 250 pounds a week. So I said it was a damn good living for nothing because the stories he was telling were so old and badly delivered into the bargain. The someone who overheard me said, do you think you could do a week up there in front of a crowd like this? I've always found challenges hard to refuse so I put a bold face on and said yes. Pace of cake, and the bet was a strong pace of cake. I approached the Lipthorpe brothers, who owned the Fiesta clubs at Sheffield and Lipthorpe. Stockton. <laughs> yeah. They were willing to let me do a week. They paid me a bit of brass too. Of course, they I had a marvellous time. Otherwise. They thought of a great idea to present me to the audience, projecting a film of me bowling at the audience on a paper screen. <laughs> and at just the right moment, I burst through, leaving the screen in shreds. And it the audience shook them rigidly the first. Coronary. I went down a treat because I can make up my own original jokes oh, yeah. as well as tell them properly. Oh. I kept it up seven nights a week for nearly a month Congratulations. before I realised that much though I enjoyed it, I had more important things to do. Yeah. To be truthful, I got fed up with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's Joe Michael McIntyre feels the same way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Fred was a brilliant stand-up comedian, but the tape really was. gets deeply, deeply personal. I mean, it's a, 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 he can't help giving it a comic flourish, even when he's speaking very seriously <laughs> about something that matters to him. He yeah. gives it a comic flourish. Here he was talking about uh, his marital uh, difficulties. If things were going better for me on the cricket field at the end of the 50s, they certainly weren't at home. Oh. In fact, my marriage was beginning to break up. On reflection, I suppose it was inevitable. I met Enid in 1951 at a cocktail party given by her father, who was the mayor of the Scarborough at the time. We married in 1955 and set up a house in West Ayton, outside Scarborough. The first five years or so passed by happily enough. I worked hard at trying to make the marriage a good one. I believed in family life and had been raised to regard marriage as a contract for life. There was nothing I could do about it, being away from home when we travelled to play other counties. And the six-month tours abroad placed a tremendous strain on our relationship. Cricketers are human. When you're used to a healthy, marital relationship, it's more than flesh and blood can stand to go without sex for six whole months. Oh, calm down, Fred. Yeah. Quite a long Enid time. never accused me of sleeping with other women on the tours. But she was an intelligent woman, 
and must have known that I had had the odd bird. <laughs> you can tell he was a great comic because he had great yeah. comic timing. My, my grandfather, this is a true story, sold him these carpets because he had a shop in Scarborough. Really? Fred came in, yeah. That's really? a true story, yeah. Okay. Well, it's brilliant. Well, I don't I know where I go that. with that, Andy, but it's, it's a conversation <laughs> stopper. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. let's carry on then. Yeah. And uh, right. well, that, basically, we're continuing down the, the same route. Life was difficult for Fred, well, as he explains. Yeah, definitely. I was upset and disappointed at the time. But I can understand now just how fed up she must have felt. Would have taken an angel to enjoy being my wife at that time. The rousing scenes got worse and worse until I frequently left the house and spent the night in my car. There was one notable occasion in 1961 when I was playing against the Australians at Headingley. And on the Saturday afternoon, I had six wickets for one run spell in less than an hour to put them all out. The press were calling it the finest piece of pace bowling ever seen in a test. Of course they I wondered to myself what they would have thought if they had known I'd spent the previous night in the back of my car in a Leeds car park with an overcoat for a blanket, arriving at the ground before anyone else so that I could have a wash and shave. For a long time, my address was often the car, Yorkshire Dales. <laughs> nice, nice address. Yeah, they probably would have said you should sleep in your car all the time, yeah. six for one. That's right. Well, that's that's what you should get Jimmy Anderson in a car. <laughs> if, he was, if he was superstitious, <laughs> he probably would have done that before every test match. <laughs> Um, of course, so we, he talked about his uh, uh, on-field problems as well. Yeah. And he'd had a few run-ins with the powers that be, hadn't Yes, he? that's true. We had the usual upsets with the West Indian umpires. A strange breed of animal umpires. In Britain, we have the finest in the world. Oh, of course. Because they are practically full-time professionals. In Australia, I found they could go either way. Hmm. In India, they were terrible. Oh, in the West Indies, they have the worst in the world. Jeez. For example, in one match, <laughs> I managed to find a wet spot and oh. made the ball rear up. It hit one batsman, a real crack on his glove, and the catch was taken at short leg. But the umpire turned the appeal down. And when I protested, <laughs> he said the ball had struck his thigh pad. I told him that you don't normally find a thigh pad in front of a man's throat, and pointed to the batsman, who had taken off his glove to inspect the damage to his hand. Now, something you learn about Fred is yeah. uh, he, he wasn't great with authority, really, no, in those uh, situations. And most cricketers would be very upset with the umpire. They'd shake their head, they'd walk back their mark, and they'd bowl again. They'd put it down to experience, so you get some yeah. uh, or you don't get some. Well, that's, that's the, the way, way it is, of course. Sadly, that wasn't uh, Fred's way of uh, dealing with things. This man was being so blasé into the bargain that I was really furious. And I'm afraid I hit him in the mouth and he had to be carried off. <laughs> well, Mike Gatting, all the stick he got for having yeah. a row with an umpire. I like I'm the knocking the bloke out. I like the idea of Fred's wet spot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not altogether sure. No. So there we are. <laughs> uh, there he was. That was a little bit of H&J Gold. The tape, apparently, if you hunt yeah. around for it, if you want the full story, yeah. the, uh, the Fred Truman Great Balls of Fire, it is still available out there. Our young assistant producer, John Cadigan, mm. has, has had a real edu it's been a real education. He's a man who loves his cricket. He loves it, yeah. And I think all current cricketers should have a listen to it. <laughs> when Fred came in, uh, when his uh, book came out, the, the second uh, autobiography, it was about five or six years before he died. Oh, yeah, this was good. He came in, uh, and I said to him, on as you always do when you sign off, when you speak to a guest. And I said, uh, well, Fred, it's been an absolute honour to meet you, and um, the very best of luck with the book. And he just looked us straight in the eye and said, I have no doubt it will be a very big seller. <laughs> <laughs> He's just a man with no self-doubt No self-doubt, which is probably what made him such a, a great sportsman. So there we are. A little bit of uh, uh, F.S. Truman there from the H&J Gold. Let's check in with Lisa O'Sullivan. They don't make characters like that in cycling. Or maybe they do. Yeah. Um, uh, Lisa, yeah. But, uh, for any Fred Trumans out there on the mountain today? I think all of them are, aren't they? They <laughs> definitely, definitely would back themselves in a, in a one-man race. Well,